Hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the first uh, Enigma conference. My name is Bill Weddington. Uh, I work on a tool called Panopticlick, uh, and it is a tracker and fingerprint detection tool. But as much as this is a talk about a tool, it's also a talk about how when it comes to combating pervasive online surveillance, all hope is not lost. We should not succumb to privacy nihilism. So before I get into what Panopticlick does, I really wanted to talk about the history of online surveillance, which deals with the history of surveillance more generally. Before you, you see this uh, model of the, this is a schematic for the Panopticon, from which Panopticlick derives its name. Now this was conceptualized first by Jeremy Bentham in 1787 as really a first new type of prison that would keep track of inmates as they go about their daily lives, every single little interaction they have and every movement they have being tracked in this prison. Uh, you can see that the, uh, they can be monitored through a central node here marked by N, uh, and all the prisoners are lined up in the A blocks. Uh, we thought of this as a great analogy for what web trackers attempt to do when they track you and your web movements online. So uh, really, the history of online tracking begins in the late 90s and really hits the media spotlight by 1999. This article by Glenn Fleischman from that year laments the fact that browser cookies can be used as a way to track users. Uh, now, not only can they be uh, used as a way to, to track users across their movements, but we were seeing a real change in the way that the web is uh, structured. Um, the old web, which could be modeled as a simple lookup table, was uh, starting to fade away as we see more and more user data starting to be gathered by servers. Now, uh, the, the, this old web, the web as we know it, uh, changed in the late 90s, uh, and this, there was, you know, the unidirectional kind of information flow started to be superseded by a bidirectional uh, information flow as uh, the information was not only being delivered from servers to clients, but from clients to servers as well. By 2009, 10 years later, the situation had gotten so bad that this article by Ed Felton in Freedom to Tinker uh, really reminisces on the good old days when online trackers would just use cookies to track users. Uh, the idea is that uh, cookies are really a transparent way to track users. Um, this idea of the uh, cookies being this transparent way to track users uh, really got, gives us a sense, a sense of uh, how bad things had gotten already by this point. So what happened? How did things get this bad in the span of a single decade? Well, trackers started to rely on the pervasive usage of browser plugins like Flash, Java, and Silverlight to really uh, act as a persistent data store for users' data. Not only was it a persistent data store, but it also circumvented the normal mechanisms that are built into the browser for purging cookies. Uh, in this way, the trackers were becoming much more sneaky about what they were doing. Uh, and this was the first kind of instance that we saw of them trying to really be covert about their actions. Uh, and what's more, in this, uh, you know, basically these plugins were able to collude with one another in tracking users if they are not simultaneously, and respawn cookies, if they're not simultaneously deleted in every single one of uh, these three. Uh, in 2010, security researcher Sami Kamkar uh, really published this proof of concept of this ever cookie, as he labeled it. Uh, the ever cookie could be used if you, uh, in this way. If you have cookies that are purged in Silverlight and Java, but not Flash, then the Flash cookie code can be used to propagate it to the other plugins immediately, just after it's deleted. So this really makes it so that the trackers can achieve a level of persistence that's very, very difficult to break. In addition to the persistent source of data, we have this thing called fingerprinting. So whenever your browser accesses a site, it leads, leaves bits of information about what it's doing uh, upon every request. 
these bits of information can be correlated and combined to form a unique picture of your browser. The techniques that are used, uh, particularly, are those uh, like, for instance, uh, 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 font detection, which can be done in JavaScript, Java, and Flash, as well as detecting client headers that are sent upon every request. So these two things, persistent data stores and fingerprinting, can be used to pinpoint individuals. And you know, not only that, but the inclusion of ad-based trackers on the web really made it so that you can be tracked across the entire web and not just on individual pages. So at EFF, we really were confident that browser fingerprinting was possible. And not only that, we wanted to gather more and learn more about the ways that this was possible, the ways that browsers were delivering these unique bits of information about users. And so in 2010, January 2010, we launched Panopticlick 1.0. We asked volunteers to participate in this experiment. And this was not just to learn more about uh, users' unique browsers and the little bits of information that they're leaving, but also for users themselves to get a good idea about how unique their browsers are. So when I talk about this idea of entropy uh, or uniqueness, what I'm really talking about is entropy. And entropy is measured in bits, so it's log base 2. In order to find out the number of bits that you need to uniquely identify someone, you take the log base 2 of the entire population that you're measuring from. For instance, it takes 32.7 bits of entropy to uniquely identify someone on planet Earth because uh, it, 2 to the 32.7 is about 7.1 billion, or about how many people there are on planet Earth. In order to, to measure the change in entropy when something is new is revealed about someone, we can use this equation here. Now, this is best illustrated by example. In order to measure the change in entropy when we learn that someone is a Capricorn, we take the log base 2 of 1 12th of the population, which is the portion of population, roughly, that is a Capricorn. That gives us 3.5 bits. In order to measure the change in entropy when someone we learn someone is born on January 2nd, we take log base 2 of 1 over 365, about the, the amount of population that is born on that date. That gives us 8.51 bits. Really, we can uh, measure and we can kind of correlate and combine these facts and uh, come up with uh, by combining independent facts about someone, we can learn their unique identity uh, and measure and actually add these bits of ent entropy to uh, come up with a, a total uh, and uniquely identify them personally. Now, uh, you might notice that in this example, these are not actually independent facts. If you know that someone is born on January 2nd, then you already know that they're a Capricorn. Thus, you can't add up the bits of entropy to get you 12 bits. Uh, so this is kind of you know, uh, a way to uniquely identify someone. But um, you know, the upshot of all this is that the more entropy, the more uniqueness you have, and the less your privacy is. So the metrics that we're using with Panopticlick were a mixture of headers and JavaScript detected properties. And the total population that we were measuring from was all the volunteers that came and take the, that took the test. Uh, and you know that um, if you have JavaScript enabled uh, by, for example, then you can use JavaScript and headers. And if you have JavaScript disabled, then you only have the headers to go on. So in that case, the users were much better protected. Uh, for instance, if uh, users were using Tor, then they were also much better protected by this metric. Uh, so we were gathering these statistics, and we were gathering it in a way that we were making sure that uh, users were very well protected, and their anonymity was guaranteed by a stringent privacy policy. So in May 2010, uh, our lead technologist at EFF uh, and Panopticlick author, Peter Eckersley, who is going to speak next, uh, published this kind of paper that describes the results that we had from the Panopticlick experiment. And it found that the overwhelming majority of browsers were uniquely identifiable. In fact, 84% of browsers had uniquely identifiable fingerprints. Among those with Flash enabled, that number jumps to 94% with uniquely identifiable fingerprints. 
Now, this was enough to drive home the fact that users needed to take concrete steps in order to ensure that uh, and get a reassurance that their browsers were protecting them. So at the same time, tracking techniques were kind of going to new levels. Show of hands, how many know, people know what this graphic is describing here? OK, a few of you. Well, this is a technique called canvas fingerprinting, and it renders text onto a canvas HTML5 canvas element. Uh, and the interesting about, thing about this is that even small changes in the configuration of the browser fonts and operating system can re, you know, really change the resulting image uh, that's rendered to the canvas element. If you serialize this image and do a hashing function over it, you get a pretty good metric, another really, you know, actually very good metric uh, for fingerprinting. And according to a study by Mechanical Turk, a small study that was conducted, you get 5.7 bits of entropy from this technique alone. This was described in a paper called Pixel Perfect in 2012, by the way. And by 2014, this technique was already being used across the board by trackers. This is an example of canvas fingerprinting from a library called Fingerprint2. Uh, in order to maximize the chances of the generated image being unique, you can see a complex interplay of different shapes and colors and fonts and UTF characters being used. So really, you know, canvas fingerprinters have gotten much, much smarter in the years since this was introduced. Canvas fingerprinting became a big problem in 2014 when two of the largest trackers, Addis and Ligatus, implemented it. Uh, as much as the 5% uh, of the Alexa top 100,000 sites were found to be tracking users in this specific way. A paper published in 2014 in July called The Web Never Forgets really started to shine a spotlight on the practices of these two trackers. And as a result, they stopped doing it. They actually stopped tracking users in this way although it's very, still po very much still possible and other trackers are still doing it. Now, at the same time, uh, tracking techniques have started to go into whole new arenas and very novel techniques are starting to emerge. I'm going to play a sound for you right quick. Show of hands, how many people know what that sound is? Yeah, one or two of you. Um, so that's actually, uh, you know, if you haven't heard it, then your dog might recognize it. Um, this is a, uh, it's not really or ordinarily audible by the human ear, but I lowered the pitch to make sure that you can hear it. This is a tracking beacon by a company called Silverpush. And uh, Silverpush really wants to link together all your devices using these tracking beacons. So what it does, is it conveys user data using this beacon. And then uh, if any of your devices that have the Silverpush SDK installed are within audible range, then those devices will log your viewing habits and try to link to the other devices as well across your home. Uh, now, this is really nefarious, right? They're doing this in secret. Why would they be hiding their activities why would they be hiding everything they're doing in this way? Well, I mean, there are good reasons that they're hiding it, because they know that if people found out about it, they'd be outraged that they're doing this and really try to start fighting back against it. And in fact, it has raised concerns and complaints to the FTC, uh, where you know, uh, they, you know, certain organizations had started saying this cross-device uh, fingerprinting is what the category of these fingerprintings uh, are called. Cross-device fingerprinting is a big problem, and we want to see some regulation in this area. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen any results just yet, so this is also still available. So all this paints a really like pretty bleak picture. Uh, trackers are getting smarter and smarter, and they can even jump devices. When I started this talk, I said that we should really, you know, we should have some hope and we shouldn't subscribe to privacy nihilism. So why, you know, what's the, what's the like, why do I, what am I, why am I actually this hopeful for, for uh, a future without privacy 
uh, without, without uh, trackers uh, eroding our privacy. Well, there are some encouraging trends, even outside of protection software. Flash is dying, and it's dying really quickly. Um, we've seen the prevalence of Flash on pages go from just under 50% to just above 20% in the last five years alone. And it's not just Flash. Java, Silverlight, the other plugins are also dying as well, very quickly. And good riddance, uh, really, they, they erode the, uh, our ability to take control of our browsers. With the, you know, wh wh when they're you know, declining, and, and really what this means is that we can start to use the normal browser APIs to rein in some of the worst abuses of the past, to really start to just start to regain control of our browsers again. In 2010, browsers implemented the do not track header and started supporting it. Uh, what, this tracker, uh, what this header does is it allows users to actually opt out of being tracked. Now, this is a nice idea, uh, but it's really not legally enforceable, and there's no reason that trackers have any incentive to obey this to actually start, stop tracking users if users just say, I don't want to be tracked. Unfortunately, that's not quite enough for users not to be tracked. So at EFF, we started to change the dynamic by providing an incentive for tracking uh, companies and ad tracking companies to, to uh, really respect user privacy and not to track them. Uh, on August 3rd of last year, we launched the Do Not Track policy, along with a coalition of organizations such as uh, Disconnect, Medium, Adblock, and ad company, ad tech company, AdZerk. Participating companies, they post this policy onto a well-known location behind their web route, and it promises not to track users. They could do this out of the goodness of their hearts, but why would they? What's the real incentive here that I'm talking about? Well, just a few days after launching our Do Not Track policy, we launched Privacy Badger. You might have heard of it. Uh, Privacy Badger, it, it's a tracker blocker, but it also selectively allows resources that have promised to protect users in this way to have promised to not track users by posting the Do Not Track policy. So if a site wants to ensure that its resources are maximally available, then what they do is they, you know, start, you know, promise not to track users. And then tra uh, users with Privacy Badger installed will actually be able to access all the other site. You know, um, version 1.0 of Privacy Badger was launched on uh, August 6th of last year. And it's really unlike any other tracker blocker that we've seen. It takes a heuristic approach to blocking. So basically, it looks when third parties start setting cookies. And if it does this, if these you know, cookies being, uh, are, are set by three, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, they're set across three first party domains, then that means that this is a shady behavior, this is a tracker, we'll start blocking it. Uh, and it's not just cookies. For instance, that canvas fingerprinting thing that we've been doing, well, uh, you know, we have seen this and these third parties, uh, that's shady when they do that, so we look to that as another indication that these are trackers that, you know, uh, are really nefarious and we should block them. Here we can see Privacy Badger in action. Uh, the wider the adoption of Privacy Badger and other tools that support the Do Not Track policy, the more incentive ad tech companies have to really uh, try to make you know, and, and subscribe to the Do Not Track policy itself so that their resources uh, are maximally available. In December, we launched Panopticlick 2.0. With this second iteration of Panopticlick, we really uh, tried to bring you a new suite of tools, um, and it tests whether your tracker and ad blocking software, how well that's working. Uh, so we've set up a number of domains, and those domains are really mimicking the behavior of ad tech and tracker companies. So the way that these that works is that these domains include resources in such a way that they'll trigger three different types of tracker blockers. Those that use domain blacklisting, those that also those that use uh, URL fragments to block, and also those like Privacy Badger that take the heuristic approach. Uh, if you see that these uh, tracker blockers are being triggered, then we can be assured that they're working properly. 
where your protection is absent or misconfigured, then we really try to nudge you in the direction of installing Privacy Badger to protect yourself. In this third row, we see that, you know, are you actually, is your tracker blocker uh, respecting the do not track commitments? Uh, so that's, you know, good, another good indication that you have a good pri uh, privacy uh, mechanism in place in your browser. And finally, we've radically simplified the results of the fingerprinting test so that users that are novice or they don't have good technical abilities can really get a good at a glance look at how unique their browser is. So, um, you know, don't worry though, we have the full fingerprint results available behind a single click so that you can look at those fine grained results for yourself. In addition to tracker blocking and ad blocking tests, we've open sourced the code base and rewritten the back end completely in Python Flask so that you can look at it and see how it works yourself. We've also added six new fingerprinting metrics. That include the do not track header, uh, canvas fingerprinting, uh, WebGL fingerprinting, and a few others. Uh, that really, these are intended to make the results more accurate uh, to uh, reflect really how unique your browser fingerprint is uh, right now. And finally, we've really uh, tried to measure up your browser uh, against those other browsers that we're seeing in the moment, in real time, um, instead of every other browser that we've ever seen, because that's another good way to get more accurate results for your fingerprinting and uniqueness. So in the last month, we've seen the tracker tests run over 250,000 times. And we've seen over 8,900 unique IPs start to be protected. Now, if this second number seems low, consider the fact that if you're running a, in a VPN or you're running Tor, for instance, that's only one single IP that'll be recorded because that's only one exit node that you'll see. Uh, also, if a tracker blocker or protection tool is installed after they see that their results are less than perfect, then we'll log that on a separate IP and we won't catch that in this second statistic. So now that I've shown you what Panopticlick can do, I want to show a little bit of our plans for the future. We plan to open up the data as much as we possibly can without risking the anonymity of our users so that you can actually use these statistics in the projects that you run. We've already started to use Panopticlick as a testing framework for Privacy Badger, so that when Privacy Badger blocks resources, we want to make sure that it's behaving properly. And we hope other tracker blockers will implement Panopticlick as their testing framework as well. And finally, we want to add additional tracking tests to Panopticlick. For instance, uh, local storage objects, when they're set by third-party uh, resources, they're included on your first-party pages. That's kind of shady. We want that to be ensured that that is also being checked uh, and make sure that your, block, your blocking protection is using that as well. So how can I be so, you know, how can I have so much hope for a future uh, without web trackers watching our every move? Well. It's because with tools like Privacy Badger and Panopticlick, we can see exactly how much data they're gathering against us and set some rules and uh, limits around what they can gather about us and start fighting back against it. So if you'd like to get involved, please go to our GitHub at github.com slash efforg slash panopticlickpython. I know that's a mouthful, but just go to the URL. Uh, and please test it for yourself at panopticlick.eff.org. Thanks very much.